This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you need hosting for your art portfolio, blog, or online store, Squarespace has all the website building, marketing, and analytics tools you need to build a sleek website and grow your brand. Hey friends, and welcome to what is hopefully the final installment of me trying to finish up this sketchbook. This has been a long time in the making, and I've been trying to finish this up for months now because, hey, I ended up getting into some newer things on the channel this year, and by extension, I didn't have as much time to work in my sketchbook. But today, I'm going to be painting over some sketches of Wednesday and Enid from the new Wednesday show, you know, completely indulgently. I mean, do you see how I'm dressed right now? I am basically dressed like a fusion of Wednesday and Enid. So, you know, grab your sketchbook, draw along with me. This is gonna be kind of a long one. But first, if you're an aspiring illustrator, content creator, or musician, you need a place to showcase your work to your audience, which is something you can create super easily with this video's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace offers dozens of professional and customizable website and portfolio templates that help you to define your brand exactly the way you want. Creating a portfolio through Squarespace is so simple that I have two. One for my illustrator, work and one for my garment and costume designs. Setting up my site only took about an hour thanks to their high customization of things like text, colors, various website pages, page blocks, and gallery tools like automatic image scaling that automatically arrange your pieces into galleries of work after you upload them. I also quite like that I can showcase my Instagram gallery next to my portfolio thanks to social blocks which allow you to link your social media accounts to your Squarespace site. Squarespace also has a host of great features that help you to connect to your audience like members areas which allows members to subscribe and receive exclusive content, and email campaigns, which can alert your audience when new videos or merchandise releases. And speaking of merchandise, Squarespace makes it easy to find your portfolio and products all in one place with their e-commerce platform. And we're all busy these days, so thankfully you can link a print-on-demand service like the one I use to your Squarespace store for a hands-free selling experience. So if you want to effortlessly showcase your fan art of homicidal teenagers, head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, head to squarespace.com slash pricklyalpaca to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you so much to Squarespace for giving me the financial encouragement to finish this sketchbook. Now, let's get started. Okay, hi, hello lovies, and welcome back to the painting. Like I said, today I'm just gonna be painting over some sketches of Wednesday and Enid from the new Wednesday show, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And I'm going to get to talking about some of the details of the show in just a couple of minutes, but first I'm going to do just general life update, kind of what's going on with the channel at the moment. And this voiceover is going to be a little bit podcasty all over the place. So I hope you have your drawing materials of choice and you're kicked back because this is gonna be just chill content this week because it's just kind of what I need. <laughs> so before I get into life updates, I just want to say, first of all, I am sorry for the glare on the painting as I'm starting on the Wednesday sketch because I had to do these at night, like in the evening hours and with my lighting setup, light wasn't super diffused. It was kind of reflective. So while the paint was drying, it's not the best view of how the painting is coming out, which was a little bit frustrating, but it does dry and then it looks better later on and you can see more of like the painting process itself and how the colors are mixing and applying because at first I was like, I don't know if you can even see the colors I'm laying down. This is super frustrating, but like it's been super overcast here the last couple of days. And then I've just been working on like other work during the day. So I did this in the evening, which was probably a mistake. Um, frustrating, but it is what it is. Anyways, to talk about the artistic process a little bit here. I'm just using acrylic paint with these and I am using my usual method if you are a somewhat regular viewer of my painting content. Basically just going down and laying down like a base skin tone layer and then building up tones depending on if they're like mid-tones or the darker values or the lighter values and just doing that and trying to match the tonality um, and then you know trying to match Jenna Ortega's skin tone because like since they make Wednesday so pale in the show it's like kind of a different skin tone that I'm used to working with 
with because, you know, Jenna Ortega still has like color to her skin tone and I want that to come through, but also like maintaining Wednesday in the show, she looks kind of pale. So that was kind of a struggle with the skin tone. I feel like in the first couple of minutes, especially of this, you're going to see me struggling a little bit. But in the end, I think I actually got decently close, especially since I was going for a somewhat specific lighting scenario. Like I was working from kind of a reference photo, trying to sort of match that since it was slightly blue tinted in direct lighting. You'll see later on whenever I get into this, but her clothes and hair and like facial details were way easier and way more fun to paint. I was able to be like kind of stylized with it and I used a lot of strong like blues and purples like they do in the show. I do really love the color palette of the show, especially the first couple of episodes where like the fall leaves that are very yellow and orange are tinted like super saturated and then they color graded the sky to be like bright blue and that combined with like Wednesday's dark wardrobe is just very satisfying to me. But that's kind of the gist of the illustration. But anyways, I'm already talking about the Wednesday show. I feel like I can save life updates for a little later in the voiceover and just go right into talking about it because we're all out here eating it up and I feel like everyone's kind of talking about it right now. I feel like for some people it might get old super fast so I'm sorry if any of you are sick of hearing about it but this you saw the thumbnail. What can I say? Okay so overall opinions of the show. I thought it was a good bit of fun. It was goofy. It was cheesy. It hit the aesthetics in that warm fuzzy place. You know it's not the deepest show in the world and honestly going into it I didn't really expect to like it. I was like oh is this like another Adams Family type cash grab, but it seems like they did kind of have an idea, a plan. I think this is a good way to kind of repackage the Adams Family for more of a modern audience and especially for more of like a teen demographic because that is another thing that I actually do appreciate about the show. It's like, you know, kind of for anyone, but it's something that teenagers can watch and it's, it's not euphoria, you know, like your teen can watch this and it's fine. In that same vein, I also appreciate that the cast Casting is people who actually look like teenagers. I feel like I'm watching, you know, children in high school interact instead of watching a bunch of 26 year olds acting like children in high school interact because that can just get feeling pretty awkward and pretty fast. And like, I understand you have to have adult actors if you have any kind of adult content in your show or film. But you know, like that's not a necessity of mine. I, I don't really need to see adult content with teenagers. Once again, I'm looking at you, Euphoria, and every other show trying to be edgy. <laughs> Anyways, that is all to say that I do really enjoy the casting, especially of Jenna Ortega. She did so well with the role. I think everyone universally agrees that she makes a really great Wednesday, especially this version of Wednesday where she's tried to intentionally put her own spin on it and set it apart from Christina Ricci's iteration of Wednesday, which was like iconic in its own right. I think they'll both be very memorable versions of the character at the end of the the day but for different reasons and I think that exploring Wednesday as an adolescent in high school is a new edge for her because I saw an interview with Jenna Ortega where she's like you know the whole dark girl saying very macabre things kind of gets old whenever someone ages into the teenage years so you have to find a way to act that in a way that's still endearing. I think that's probably a very difficult feat but I think she really pulled it off it still comes off as being like endearing and kind of cute even though she's just like she threatens Enid full on multiple times. She's just like, I want to kill you right now. Please, I want to kill you. And somehow we're just like, aww. And you know, I think some of that endearing nature, especially between her and Enid, is just that black cat golden retriever dynamic that they have going on. I think that's probably one of the best parts of the show. They have like a great dynamic, great chemistry. I think they have a very organic little friendship character arc in the first season. I can't wait to see more of them. And oh my gosh, slight spoilers for the end of the season, but whenever <laughs> Wednesday finds finally hugs Enid back at the end. It's just like the vibes that I got was those calendars that you see where like little kittens and puppies are cuddling. Just golden retriever and little black kitten cuddling. That's that's it. That's the vibe. And it's so wholesome. I have to say I love most of the dynamics between Wednesday and her peers. Like uh, of course I love Wednesday and Enid. They're great. And then Bianca is actually very slay. I just love her character from the beginning. Even from the fencing scene where she's supposed to be like Queen Bee. Kind of like a mean girl. I was like I'm rooting for her. She's already so much fun. I never got a vibe of she's malicious. I was always like okay she's a confident queen. We love that. Exactly. 
Xavier, on the other hand, I don't know. I just kind of got stinky boy energy from him from the beginning. I didn't really like the way he was immediately just so desperately coming after Wednesday. That was kind of annoying. I hope that they just pursue a friendship between them in second season because like, ew, that's one thing, you know, we're not here for the love triangles between him and Wednesday and what's his face, Tyler. I don't even remember what his name is because he just like, you know, those boys rubbed me the wrong way. I think everyone's kind of saying that though. I think universally everyone agrees that like we didn't need that. It was just kind of obnoxious to see. But I think what it did accomplish was serve some character development for Wednesday. I think that's the purpose of it narratively. And I'm sorry, spoilers going into this next part for sure. There's already been spoilers in the video. I'll put a warning before even like the voiceover starts. But this is definitely a coming of age show for Wednesday. And it feels like her figuring herself out and trying to navigate high school like any other normal kid. So I think in terms of the romance, even though it's kind of annoying, especially since a lot of it was just like, plot device for the sake of the big twist or whatever. I think it serves the purpose of showing, you know, whenever you're growing up and like dating people, you don't always know what you want. I don't think Wednesday ever really wanted Tyler, but she was like, I don't know, you're here. You're kind of being nice to me whenever he was kind of just, you know, manipulating her. And I don't think she's ever shown any genuine interest in Xavier. So I think it kind of just goes to show like people will pursue you who you might not be interested in. And it kind of makes sense for both Tyler and Xavier to go after this misunderstood dark girl because I feel like they're kind of the like outcast level nerds in their social situations. So maybe they're projecting on Wednesday a little bit and being like, oh, she's misunderstood like me. That means she'll understand me. And it also, you know, doesn't hurt that Jenna Ortega is really, really pretty. So yeah, she's gonna have a bunch of men that she doesn't want to date coming after her. Of course she is. I feel like sometimes Wednesday just lets whoever be around her because either she's being a little bit neutral and complacent about it or she's like actively trying to use them. So while I think she did grow to care about both Tyler and Xavier, some of it was how can I use you to my own ends while, you know, undergoing this investigation? And some of it I think was just curiosity, especially with Tyler. Like this is a new experience and you seem on a surface level like you understand me or you're trying to understand me. So Tyler kind of took those emotions and exploited them because, you know, he was the monster all along. So if anyone's worried about them doing like a really basic annoying romance with her next season, especially with her and Xavier, I wouldn't be too worried about that. I don't think that's the direction they're going to go in. At least I certainly hope not. Okay, we've talked about some of the crusty, desperate boys. Now let's talk about best boy Eugene. What a sweetheart. Oh my gosh, I loved him in the story. I love how they have sort of like a surrogate Pugsley since we can't have Pugsley there right now. Not only is he just like a beekeeping little sweetheart and a really really good like sidekick for Wednesday. My gosh, I love their little friendship so much. It's so wholesome. But I also feel like narratively, it was really effective for showing what Wednesday's relationship with Pugsley is like, even though we couldn't have him there. And it shows that that ever so slightly soft and caring side that this Wednesday does have. And it's really good for character development because it gives her something to care about. And it kind of shows her that she can't just go along acting like she doesn't care about anything because she does. And it kind of just breaks her character down into this fundamental like she's just a teenager trying to learn how to be a person just like all of the other teenagers at nevermore seeing those softer sides was really good to see like you know eugene enid all the other friends she made because i think it works really well for the character because at first you know we're used to wednesday adams being just fully cynical like no softness just i want to murder things i want to <laughs> hook my brother up to an electric chair you know just unhinged wednesday but you know in this show they're trying to put a different spin on things. They're trying to, you know, make it relatable for the average teen. And I feel like in this show, they almost did that thing where they give you a character and they kind of make you dislike them at first. Not that you dislike Wednesday, but in the sense that they lay all of their flaws out on the table and you're like, wow, I see how very flawed this character is. Because, you know, Wednesday at first, she's very selfish. She uses people. She's manipulative. She says lots of rude things all the time. Those in a functional society Society are very obviously like character flaws. You kind of revel in her doing all those things though because 
you know, that secret side of you that's like, oh man, I wish I could tell someone off like that. But they don't reveal a lot of vulnerability or softness at all at first. She's just like kind of one note. She's going to say something snarky to you. She's going to threaten, you know, bodily harm upon you. But as you get deeper in the plot, she kind of starts to care about what's going on and she has, you know, more and more humanizing moments. Oh, this character is vulnerable because she does care about people. She cares about her friends and her family. And she's not totally selfish. She helps people. She cares about people. In some ways, a lot of these things are just kind of a front. So it kind of reminds me a little bit of, okay, nerd moment, what Dave Filoni did with Ahsoka Tano whenever he added her to the Star Wars, specifically Clone Wars universe. He knew, okay, people are going to have trouble attaching to this character and empathizing with her and finding her to be likable because she's not technically supposed to exist in this universe. Like, Anakin didn't have a Padawan at first. That's a retcon. So he kind of made her a little bit bratty and, like, naive and impulsive at first. And she's mouthing off to these established characters that we already like. And it kind of makes you see all of her flaws and be like, I don't know if I like this character. But then they wrote several episodes with her that were very relatable where you can clearly empathize with the position she's in. And it really humanizes her and endears you to her and you feel bad for the situation that she's in. You kind of just think, oh gosh, that is really difficult to deal with. And in the end of the arc in the few episodes, she comes off as being very humble and teachable, but she still has like an air of confidence to her because she's learning and she's figuring out her place in this world. That was a very intentional writing decision on Dave Filoni's part. And if you start paying attention to TV, a little bit more. I feel like it's a very common arc that characters go on. It is very effective for just making your audience care about your characters and like an almost 180. And obviously I don't think that's exactly what they did with Wednesday. I think in the beginning with Wednesday they kind of like laid out all of her flaws, all the things that are like, you know, would be very unpleasant about a real person, but gave it that air of this is a fantasy. This is all what some part of us wishes we could do. We all wish that we could put, you know, piranhas in the same pool as, you know, the swim team bullies. We all wish we could tell off the principal weemses in our life. But I think what they did is they took all of those, like, obvious flaws and all those things that seemed like invulnerabilities to the character, and they said, actually, there's an antithesis to this. She is caring. She can be warm in her own way. And also, she isn't invulnerable. She has vulnerabilities. She can get her and in that way, she needs allies and she needs to build these friendships in this story. Because, like, who saves her at the end of the season? It's Enid. And Principal Weems helps a little bit. So, in general, I think that's what the show does well. It's like those character relationships, even though they don't have the most depth. I mean, it's season one, first of all. Also, it's kind of like a somewhat family-friendly kind of show. We're not going to get super deep with it. But I do genuinely like all of the cast and all of the characters. I think they get along well with each other. And I think that's one of the reasons why the show has been so popular and successful. Especially since I think one of the weaker parts of the show is just the plot. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but there were some points in this show where the plot just dragged on. And I was like, are we doing this right now? What are we even trying to do? Like the part where they arrested Gomez was like, are we really? Are we spending this time? Like it was cool to see. Wednesday connect with her father in that way but also was like come on do we need this I just didn't find some of the more like CSI New York parts of the show to be super interesting I didn't really want to see this turn into a crime drama I liked it to be more of a mystery where Wednesday is an active protagonist she's kind of driving the investigation along herself I don't like the things where the police get too involved it's just kind of boring I have seen all like 10 seasons of 24. I have seen enough police procedural shows and 24 is probably the least police procedural show that you can even watch. They had their moment in the 2010s and in the aughts and now let's let them die. I think that aspect of the mystery just kind of dragged on a lot and that's just an issue with these like, you know, eight episode TV shows. I feel like they have plenty of content but they 
drag like the plot out to where you have something in the beginning, in the end, and in the middle. It's just like running around doing, you know, God knows what. A show like this that is character driven, in my personal opinion, is at its best whenever we're just watching the characters interact and do their thing. And we have that, you know, plot thread running throughout all the episodes. But that's not like what's really driving the narrative. The characters themselves, their interactions, their little drama, that's what's driving the narrative. It's not plot driving the characters that gets on my nerves. I think that happened a little bit here. And what I mean by that is like, I personally just, I liked the characters and I just want to watch them live their life and interact. And if Wednesday living her life means I'm going to go to the morgue and it, it, examine this dead body, I'm going to go do my thing. I'm going to investigate Xavier's like painting workshop. That's like her being an active protagonist and doing things. But then there's just some aspects where it's like, oh, we've got to connect this to the past in this very like forced, you know, commentary on colonialism, which it's like, your heart is in the right place. But like, did we really just bring a dead pilgrim back for an MCU style final fight? What are we doing? Did we need that? It's just like, it's so lame watching Wednesday Adams fight a pilgrim. It just feels like a forced part of the narrative because it's like, we have to have a big end fight because apparently every single show that's somewhat action oriented or mystery oriented has to have some big end battle. Yo, I'm real sick of that. I didn't like it in WandaVision. I don't like it now. It doesn't do anything for me. I did, however, like the big werewolf beasties fighting. That was a lot of fun. But that's the unhinged content that I come here for. Also, we're invested in those characters because it's our best girl Enid fighting Tyler, the desperate, stinky loser boy. And it's the first time she's wolfing out. Of course I want to see her kick his butt. I care about that. But Jonathan McSuckface or whatever his name is, I don't care about him. He was already dead. Yeah, he sucks. He was awful. But he was already dead. It's just weird. I know it was an opportunity to throw Christina Ricci into the plot and make her character significant, but I feel like you could do without that plot line or at least do without the MCU style pilgrim battle. I like the inclusion of Goody Adams. I think that was really cool. I think having someone to kind of teach Wednesday about the past and her powers was cool. I think seeing the flashbacks was cool. I think seeing that depiction of colonial America is important. It just loves lightens the blow of seeing that when you bring a big bad pilgrim zombie back to life. It's just that that's really the, the part that didn't hit for me. And also the fact that that plot line felt ham-fisted where we weren't as invested in that whole situation because it's like, I feel like Wednesday's fighting the pilgrim instead of Christina Ricci and her character is supposed to be the villain because we're invested emotionally in Christina Ricci's character because she's like nice to us. She's nice to Wednesday. They have the emotional bond. She's the one who uses and betrays Wednesday. So, like, shouldn't that be impactful? But I'm pretty sure that Christina Ricci just has, like, a gun and they maybe fight briefly, but I don't even remember what happens because it wasn't very impactful. But yeah, for me, it was just a little bit convoluted. I get it, the show is pretty convoluted, but I feel like the rest of the things are a little bit more forgivable because it's like, I am somewhat emotionally invested in this because I care about whatever character is involved. I just feel like we could have stuck to just the hide werewolf, whatever you want to call it, plot line, maybe save Goody Adams as a recurring thing to lace throughout, you know, seasons one, seasons two, and onward, and just keep it a little bit more simple about what's going on with this mystery. Because when you go too big and magical and time-traveling zombies, you tend to lose a couple of people. And hey, I don't think the mystery of who was the hide was, you know, ironically hidden very well at all. It was either boy A or boy B. Boy A was far too obvious and they were practically screaming, it is boy A. So, hey, obviously it's the seemingly pure and innocent boy B who, I don't know, gave me weird vibes here and there. Like, it was Tyler. We all knew it was Tyler, right? Anyways, those are like my 
armchair film critic, you know, gripes from season one. Really not anything major. Like I said, it was a good bit of fun. And if you enjoyed any of these things, like, who cares what I think? You can enjoy it however you want. I still loved the show. I think it was really good. But I'm also, I'm not a film critic. I could be wrong about some of these things. Some of them just stuck out to me as being like, I don't know if we tried the hardest at this in the whole script stage of the show. But obviously, writing television is really hard especially for a character like Wednesday Adams, so I think they did pretty good. Okay, I've rambled on about this for a really long time, so before I get on to like life stuff and the other stuff I wanted to talk about in this video, I did want to just talk about Gomez, Morticia, and Pugsley. Also, real quick thing, Thing is amazing, wonderful, so much fun in the show. I'm glad they chose to put Thing at Nevermore instead of leaving Thing back home with like the Adams family because it was just fun to have him around. But anyways, getting to Gomez and Morticia, they were a little bit different than I expected them to be. You know, I, you know, am used to the 90s depiction of the Addams Family. That's my favorite iteration. I think it's that way for a lot of people. And I especially love Gomez and Morticia from that particular version. Their dynamic is just so much fun. And like the overwhelming horniness, I think, is also portrayed really well in that to the point where it's just like you delight in seeing it. You're like, oh my gosh, wow, a married couple that's actually happy? I've never seen that before. And their banter is just so playful and you you watch it, you're like, ooh, this is just fun to watch. But uh, with Catherine Zeta-Jones and I am so sorry, I forget the actor's name who portrayed Gomez. Like, I think they did a good job in the Wednesday show, but their chemistry, was, it just felt different. It was more like, okay, I'm watching my parents and this is making me feel uncomfortable, which it's supposed to be kind of from Wednesday's perspective. It makes sense, but I don't think they had as much of that fun, like, Karamiya, you know, like, eyebrow wiggle up and down energy that the 90s versions did, and I missed that. I mean, this version is fine, they did good, but I was like, I don't know, I'm kind of with you, Wednesday. I kind of want them to stop right now. But I definitely warmed up to Catherine Zeta-Jones as Morticia. I think her whole presence is just like, oh my gosh, it's Morticia. I think individually she works really well. I I also think the actor that played Gomez individually works well. I really like the scene where he was connecting with Wednesday whenever he was like being held in prison. That was just a sweet moment, but, like father daughter. I love to see it. I think the other big thing that threw me is Morticia and Gomez seem a little bit too normal. Like they're supposed to be weird too. And hey, different versions, they can characterize people however they want. But to me, I feel like they're supposed to seem very normal, like a nuclear family unit that's actually happy within their own family. They have their own weird language and way of speaking to each other. And then whenever you put that into the world with all of the normies, they're like, oh my God, what's going on? you're terrifying. But I feel like, uh, especially around other parents and stuff, like Morticia and Gomez just seemed normal. Like, yeah, we're putting our daughter in a boarding school. You know how it is. She released piranhas on another kid. What are you gonna do? But with the 90s versions, I feel like they would be proud of her. Morticia would be like, oh, Gomez. She's already growing up to be such a fine young woman. You know, like, I feel like they would just be praising her and being like, oh, our little girl, we're so proud, you know? But but again, a lot of this is probably just personal preference. I haven't spent as much time with the new Morticia and Gomez, and I love the 90s versions to death. Like, I've dressed up as them before. They're icons for a reason. And real quick, I just want to say, with Pugsley, I actually feel like he was perfect. I feel like with him, it was like the natural progression of how he would lean whenever he's older and he's being socialized in a normal high school from like a younger age and he's being bullied. It just seems a little bit more normal than the rest of them, which I think makes sense. I think that's always how he was portrayed in the 90s version too, which is like kind of my personal canon, as you can probably tell. I just really like his dynamic with Wednesday. I feel like there's a real camaraderie between the two of them. And you know, Wednesday is very protective of him and she looks out for him. And it's another one of those things that softens her a little bit. I also really love the scene where the two of them are sitting on the pier, kind of connecting and Pugsley's talking about how he like misses her and stuff. That's another very wholesome, memorable scene. And I hope that we get to see more of the family dynamic in season two, if we get a season two, which I, I can't see how we wouldn't considering I think it's like Netflix's most streamed show in a week now. So we're probably getting a season two. Anyways, finally moving on from the Wednesday show bits. I have plenty more thoughts on it, but I'm going to leave you guys at that for today. I'm probably working on the little painting of Enid at this point, And 
from how long you've been watching it, you can probably tell I was really struggling with this one just because like the reference photo that I chose, first of all, I kind of stylized it a little bit more to be more my style. And also I'm kind of trying to get out of my comfort zone whenever it comes to painting traditionally and painting faces. I tend to choose things that are very evenly lit and within my comfort zone of drawing like expressions, well, I guess specifically painting expressions in this case, and also like not having too much lighting on the different planes of the face where I have to be really specific with my uh, like, I guess, value scale and tonality whenever I'm doing those like, hey, we've got blues in here because it's a shadow, but then we also have some like warmth because there's a flesh tone under the shadow. That type of thing with acrylic paint and traditional painting is still very challenging for me. Just drawing different expressions and likeness in general is challenging for me. So despite the fact that I don't absolutely love how this little illustration came out, it was still a really good exercise for me and I think it's going to help me to push myself out of my comfort zone heading into 2023, like making things that are like a little bit harder in terms of painting because I love traditional painting. I think it's so much fun. It is also kind of the bane of my existence, but we're working on it. But I do hope you enjoy watching me work on this little painting nonetheless. Okay, real quick before I wrap up here, I'm gonna just do a couple of life updates and let you guys know what's going on and specifically kind of what's going on with my December upload schedule because so far it's already been unorthodox, unhinged, and it will continue to be. So first and foremost, I'm still very burned out from October and November and honestly just this entire year. I kind of just ended up going pretty hard with content in the last couple of months because I noticed the channel was doing well. I was feeling inspired. I was ready to go. You know, spooky season is Libra season, which means it is my most powerful time of year. And I think it really shows, especially since as soon as November hits, I am dead. <laughs> but yeah, I took next to no time off in October and I didn't sleep very much. And that kind of carried over into November and things just got kind of crazy. And I'm still really burned out and tired now. And I still don't feel like I had much of a rest at all. <laughs> but yeah, for those of you who don't know, like I do do this full time at the moment. I'm graduated from college. It's not like I have school to worry about or anything like that, but I also do have a couple of other like private commission type clients. So I've had a lot of my plate lately. So the upload schedule in December, despite me saying I wanted to do a couple of big videos, it's just going to slow down. Because the other thing is people don't watch YouTube in December. I've noticed a huge trend in everyone's numbers just slowing down and everyone's just kind of struggling with views right now, which really sucks. But what are you going to do? It's kind of seasonal. And I think the last couple of years we've been spoiled because like everyone's been at home watching YouTube even during the slower holiday seasons. So I am going to be taking a break. I'm going to try to recharge so that I can come back strong in January. I tell you there is not a brain cell left in this noggin to be making some kind of crazy dress. So I'm just not going to do it. However, this is not the video I'm going to leave you with this year because as you might have noticed at the top of this video, I'm almost done with this sketchbook. So hopefully, fingers crossed, if I stayed on my schedule one week from when this video comes out, I'm going to be dropping the sketchbook tour for this sketchbook. So the video that I'm going to leave you with at the end of the year is going to be some good, crispy content, long awaited content. So if you're interested in seeing the tour, definitely keep a lookout for that. I'm very excited to show it to you. This might be my favorite sketchbook. I don't know. I like a lot of the illustrations in here, especially the paintings, especially these paintings. And speaking of these paintings, with that, these paintings are done. I really seriously had such a good time working on these. It was very cleansing for my soul because I am still very, very stressed from just this entire year, particularly the fall season, just like kind of took it all out of me. I think that some of you are perceptive enough to notice that seeing as how I have been getting private messages on Instagram being like, hey, <laughs> maybe take a break. Um, you're right. I'm gonna take a break. <laughs> but in the meantime, this was very enjoyable to do. I love how they came out even though Enid is like a little... It's okay. But thank you so much for watching and a huge thank you goes to my patrons, especially my lovely curvaceous executive producers. Wolven underscore, Lovisa, Corvid Dome, Eloquent Silence, Midnight Nova, John L, Meeks Hunter, Cleo's, Blue, In the Galaxy, 
Mel W, Jim Jiminy, Jim Jiminy, Satoni, Sushi McNushi, Megan Penland, Owlian, Bean the Bread, Bobo McFoe, Gravity Drop, Hypnos, India, Jessica Dilling, Katie, Michael Twycross, Refnlings, Silver, Sweet Winter Garden, Welly Kelly, and Will Schmidt. Now, if you'll excuse me, bye. I'm a homicidal maniac. We look like everyone else.